to Textiles and Tea with the Ham Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Manager for HGA, and I'm going to be your host today. Today, we are going to uh, say big thank you to Grace Tully. Grace has donated several times to be sponsors for Textiles and Tea. Grace, we appreciate it so much. Um, your sponsorship helps this program keep going, and and today we're gonna to get introduced to an up and coming artist and that's so important. So thank you, Grace. As always, you can take, um, send in questions. It's the last 15 minutes of the episode, but please put them in the Q and A and not in the chat. Uh, today we have Sally Garner. Sally is a textile artist and educator based in Atlanta. Her current work explores the various opposing forces in our everyday lives and our relationship to the environment through the metaphors of weaving. And you'll see a lot of that in her work today. It's, it's amazing. She's been teaching a variety of textile techniques over the past 10 years in both classroom um, and in small workshop settings. Her work has been published in multiple times in Fiber Art Now magazine, the National Basketry, or Basketry Organization, Surface Design Association. She is currently an instructor of textiles and foundation art at Georgia State University here in Atlanta, where she's also pursuing her master's of fine arts degree. Welcome, Sally. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. We love it. Having a local girl today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, the most important question is, what is your favorite tea? Oh, uh, well, this time of year, my favorite tea is got to be like a spiced chai. But today, because it's afternoon, I have to have black tea afternoon. <laughs> I'm drinking a white tea and it's got like very peppermint flavoring to it. It's really great. <laughs> oh, it's great for this time of year. Yeah. So how did you get started in um, fibers? So I began doing like more projects for myself with knitting and crocheting back when I was uh, in high school. And then I began to transition to college arts and, and I was doing sculpture and photography. And through all that, I decided that I wanted to integrate something that I was like more rather be doing right my crocheting and knitting <laughs> and um, do that as my work and so I began to 
uh, integrate textile techniques into my sculptural work and, and that became my, my central focus and I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with the, the meditative aspect of it and it brought me great joy to do it. So I wanted to continue with it. Well, your work is very unique and we're gonna see a lot of that today, but this first image is wonderful. This is a dress made out of VCR tape. And when I was looking at this, I thought about how you seem to approach what you're making and instead of deciding that you want to produce something and, and what should you use to produce that item, it's like you seem to start with the material and then you want to explore what can that material do? Would you agree with that? That's what this dress made me think of. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. That is pretty much the approach that I go with every time uh -huh. that I that I create a piece of art is like, I really want to go in with the material first and test its limitations and see what all I can do with it. I really enjoy working with found materials as mm -hmm. well as um, recycled materials. So the VHS tape was something that was on my mind to work with from when I started um, at my undergrad doing work um, with textiles, even though my undergrad didn't have a textiles program. Um, so I was just gathering all these materials and thankfully a neighbor of my parents had a huge stash of VHS tape. <laughs> and so they gave it to me and I was able to create a bunch of, of artworks with it. Um, this particular dress was made for um, an arts foundation in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, they had a, a fashion runway kind of uh, program for charity and so they had these different categories that you had to make the dresses out of and one of them was tape and that could go in all sorts of different di um, directions like uh, masking tape is a popular one and I used the VHS tape and uh, I was just like among a bunch of costume designers creating all these fabulous works and this piece um, just by the way it sparkled and the way that it, it really just, you know, looked magical on this model. Um, I actually won the category prize for this, for the tape category. <laughs> um, but yeah, materials is, is really interest to me in all of my work. So I kind of try to put that first and try to figure out what I can do to really best show off that material. I would imagine it also had a neat sound to it. Oh yeah, <laughs> which, which, which she moved. It's one of those yeah. I wish I could see it in person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this next image is of um, we've got two images here, and the one on the left, I believe, is made out of uh, toothpicks, mm -hmm. and then the one on the right is made out of uh, knitting needles, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. What's so neat about these, I think, is as I'm looking at them. Um, it's like the real person's purpose seems to fade away. And then all of a sudden I'm just looking at it as a material to make a sculpture. It's just, mm -hmm. it's really kind of unique how you've done that. Okay, would you talk some more about these pieces? Uh, yes. So um, I started graduate school two years ago and uh, I wanted to really push what I thought of textiles in a direction that I wanted to be sculptural and kind of get you thinking about what is a textile. And believe it or not, both of these are textiles. Um, of course, then the one on the left, you can see have the kind of like woven twill um, markings and you can see that I've done it on a loom, but the other one is twined. Um, and so I just started to use rigid materials to create, to be the weft, right? And create these textiles that when they twist, they supported themselves and became these fiber sculptures that every time I put it together, it's a different piece because it's going to be um, different every time when I twist it or when somebody else does, like I've been able to show it in other places and had um, somebody else put it together and it's a completely new piece every time. Um, so that's kind of the origin of this was more of my exploration of uh, not just the materials themselves, but like how can I push the idea 
-hmm. of what textiles is. Um, and that's where I'm at right now. Um, I'm still making these sculptures, mostly out of the toothpicks. <laughs> They're amazing. And we're gonna see more because um, in these next images, we're going to show you that they're more the concept. But what I thought was unique is that you you photographed them outdoors in somewhat of a rugged setting. I don't know where it was, but with that kind of outdoorsy rugged setting. So you could have easily done these in a studio. So why did you choose that background? Well, I'm so happy you asked that question. This is actually relevant to the work that I'm currently doing in grad school. It's my thesis uh, show that's coming up in the spring. And I have been um, working with ideas based on uh, the kind of issues that might arise with um, human interaction and manipulation of nature and the patterns that are naturally within nature. And so I've been researching a lot more into uh, what our motivations are when we're doing this to um, gain some sort of, uh, you know, something that that's going to make us happy, but is not necessarily thinking about, well, what's the balance in nature going to be? And how is that going to be affected? Or is it going to be affected? Um, in a negative way and sometimes that can kind of cascade into larger issues than we intended and so I'm just kind of reflecting on that with these works. Hmm. The one on the left was actually part of the first series that I did outside and I was lucky enough to go with a group of our um, grad students to Ireland for a residency and one day I just, I mean, it was just amazing first off. Um, and I have to thank my school for allowing us to go on this journey. Um, but the, the landscape of Ireland is just incredible. And so I was so inspired that I wanted to go to the beach and like sit in the sand and the rocks and in low tide, like, do all these earthworks and so I was doing a lot of basket making and weaving outdoors putting my sculptures outside and that's when I started thinking about this aspect of my work becoming an active manipulation outside. Um, so the reason these works are photographed in nature is to bring that aspect back into play. These two are are more like either plants or creatures now that have been manipulated by me and placed back out in into the place where you think it might actually live you know um yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's so funny because when I first looked at it I thought the, oh the one on the wall left reminds me of like kill you know, that yeah. washes yeah. up on the shore. And then the middle one, it's like, that's some kind of little sea urchin. I had no idea what you were going for, but that that's what I thought of when I saw these. So it really does change the impact of the piece where it, where it's seen, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, the next work um, also has a connection to the environment, but it's a little bit different. Um, this work cast a subtle but wonderful shadow. Um, is the shadow something you planned on? It's essential for the work or was it just a wonderful addition? <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly is both a wonderful addition and it was a part of the plan. Uh, this is part of my mm -hmm. thesis show for my undergrad uh, series work and it was about memory distortions. So I wanted to use this again as VHS tape and I wanted to use the VHS tape as like a symbolic um, part of like trying to keep hold of those memories that we might uh, have of loved ones. Um, this was done during a time when I was uh, losing my grandmother to ALS. So it was me reconciling with the fact that eventually I might not remember her as well as I do now or at that time. And so I really wanted it to be something that the viewer can get lost in, can kind of go into the gallery and become a part of the installation. So the shadows were definitely part of my intention for this piece. Um, but I, until I got it in the space and was able to actually show it with those gallery lighting, you know, I had no idea how impactful that was and how much I could actually play with it. And so it's, 
um, it's something that I really enjoy doing is, is being able to create something and then play with the piece afterwards, you know, and see what all I can do with it. Um, so in, this is an example of that in that space, those, those shadows are just, you know, they were always going to be there, but these are great shadows, right? They are. They're wonderful. <laughs> now, I know somebody's going to ask, <clears throat> is this woven, crocheted, knitted? How's this made? So this was crocheted. It was crocheted okay. with the largest hook that I could find. <laughs> and even then I was crocheting it really loosely. So I might as well have been doing it with my hands, honestly, but I was using a large crochet hook and I did a couple of, by a couple, I mean a lot of different pieces that I then practically uh, sewed together with more VHS tape. Oh, well, it's, it's a powerful, powerful piece. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. um, this next one, I have to be honest, I, I chose it just because I love it so much. <laughs> it really struck me. I love this piece. Um, and it and when I heard, I read about it, you said something about it is disruption and order. So would you talk about this piece and what that statement means for you? Sure. So this is still kind of me thinking through the idea of memories and them being distorted. And I wanted something that was going to be like an image and then get that disruption in it and try to put it back together and see what happened. So I had a uh, watercolor paper and sienna type and I made a um, like a little swatch thing with a uh, window screen. You can kind of see the texture on, mm -hmm. in the piece on the right, the photo on the right. And um, I, uh, made something to create an image on that watercolor paper and the sienna type and then I did that three times <laughs> and I cut them into strips and rewove them back together mostly to see if I could get it to line up or if it didn't like how far apart it would be you know like it's kind of like trying to put that order back together um, and knowing that it never really would be the whole image again um, and that's uh, probably a really good part of this piece is like that idea um, behind it. And so I really want to continue to, to explore that. Um, I haven't gotten a chance yet to explore this, this series further, but I, I do plan to. This was a lot of fun to put together even though I did it um, a little rushed um, for a critique. <laughs> and it um, is, it's really well put together, but it, it was kind of like painstaking at the last, <laughs> the last moment. And so I'm being like, okay, this, uh, this uh, triaxial weave is, is quite difficult with watercolor, like 300 pound watercolor paper. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> but it, was, it was rewarding because this is just, I do love this piece as well. It just amazes me because when you look at the close up, it's very linear, you know, sharp to edge. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the piece, there's a softness to it, an organicity to it, you mm -hmm. know, is that the word? Um, it, there's just a softness to it. I just think that is amazing. Uh, such a neat juxtaposition. I'm glad we had both. I'm glad we had the, the mm -hmm. detail and the, the overall piece. Yeah, there's so. a blending between the images now that it's woven, so. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, I hope you'll do more. I look forward to oh. it. You know. <laughs> um, and then this next piece, this is amazing. This, you, you might have just stayed up late nights thinking about this, but this is a really unique piece because it's a um, kind of a, um, uh, a strong visual presence, you know, the the contrast of the light and dark. It has, it conjures up images. I think somebody always has some kind of connection to a rocking chair in one way or another. But and then of course is the optical illusion. And you might wanna explain it to people because again, pictures don't do it justice. But if you would, can you talk about what it is and also how you came about with this idea? Where'd that come from? Well, I want to explain the rocking chair as well, uh, first off, which is, uh, this was a part of that show with the um, crocheted VHS tape. So again, it's about those memories that I have of my grandmother. 
Um, so I also have, you know, images conjured up from rocking chairs, especially this type of rocking chair that reminds me nostalgically of my grandmother, you know, and I'm not 100% sure if technically I'm correct on that because I can't actually remember the rocking chair. Um, you know, so it's an interesting thought uh, that this could be in itself a distortion of my memories, but I have clear connections to her whenever I see this type of rocking chair. So I uh, wanted to make this something that could disappear. Uh, and so I got a wall vinyl made of the rocking chair and put it on the wall. And then you can kind of tell in the two images, the larger images that at the very top of the black and very bottom of the black, those are actually nails. And um, so I ended up doing, I had so many people help me with this, thankfully. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't imagine <laughs> doing this. Oh. I, had, I had a jig made and everything so it'd be straight and uh, it was a process but we put in like I don't know something of 2,000 or something nails along the wall and strung up just the VHS tape perpendicular to the wall so it would go up a nail and down a nail you know and so it would be the the perpendicular tape next to the wall at an angle, especially as you came into the gallery, you would see it as just pure blackness. And then as you would walk through the gallery, you would see the wall shine through behind it and including the rocking chair. Um, I had seen a similar uh, technique done by another artist. So I was influenced by other artists doing something else with tape and a perpendicular thing, but I, the optical illusion hiding that image was something I hadn't seen yet um, that I'm aware of. But um, yeah, so that that kind of came about through the concept of my show. I guess it was kind of obvious. I didn't get it, but what a what a great way to show, um, you know, when somebody's gone or losing someone or losing the memory that it's there and then it's not and then it's there again. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. That's great. I, I wish I could have seen that. That would have been neat. Now, um, how how many? Where do you get your VC8, VC8, VHS tape? I mean, that's a lot of tape. <laughs> There's actually a lot of tape on each one. I mean, it depends on the movie, but I I was thankful to get a lot of double feature, like double tape shows that like take Tannic or something. That's like three yeah, hours. Yeah. Long. <laughs> because they give you the most amount of tape, but um, I was doing a lot of research for that, and there's upwards of 850 feet per tape normally, oh. and so that piece itself took over a mile of tape to create. I did the calculations, <laughs> and um, it, but they, I don't think I used all that many roles honestly so wow. I got a lot of donations um and I still have a lot to left over <laughs> so I'm set for a while <laughs> but you just yeah if you go to like Goodwill and places like that they got yeah to be seeing it, be seeing it. yeah yeah I've gotten them there too yeah yeah <laughs> who would have thought anyway um <laughs> you're you're pretty young into your career I think if I may say so but for someone who's just starting out, you, you've done some impressive things so far. I mean, they, you've got a lot of feathers in your cap already, such as the, and I may be pronouncing this all wrong, and I apologize if I do, the Award for Excellence, and that was from the Fiber Art, Fiber Art Now has an exhibit um, online, correct? In and it's print. The, in print, I mean, in print. Yeah, um, it's the Emerging Artists. They do this every year. And... Um, you got the award for excellence there. You have, uh, I didn't list them all, but you've got exhibits nationwide. I was reading on your, you know, your blog and in your um, website, it's like, oh, well, you did this and you did this and you did this. And then I was very impressed that you got a commission from the High Point Market Authority in High Point, North Carolina. Um, and so for someone this young, how did, how are you making all this happen for yourself? One, just to share with us, but also I think there's a lot of 
artists who are getting started who would like to know, you know, is there any guidelines that you could give them? Oh, sure. Um, as for shows, I have been applying actively to juried exhibitions, and that process involves you putting in, you know, your your work into a submission, mm -hmm. and then if you get accepted, you get to go show someplace, and that's good exposure. So um, I've been doing that frequently. Uh, I've been uh, thankful to have opportunities through the different schools that I've been in uh, mm -hmm. that have made connections for us as students, you know? So um, there's a couple of shows that I've been invited to be a part of um, because of that. So that was very nice. Um, and otherwise you do have to, you know, go out and meet people and find the right people to meet, to be invited into those kind of ex exhibitions. Um, Thankfully, the, uh, the magazine Fiber Art Now is very welcoming to a lot of different fiber art yeah. mediums and techniques and styles. And so um, that's something I would definitely recommend for everybody to do is to uh, participate in their call for arts. And then uh, th as for the High Point Furniture Authority, um, <laughs> I actually was able to fulfill a need that they had uh, they were looking for somebody to build something for their VIP tent for one of their um, biannual markets. And somebody who worked with them knew of my work through my parents. They're friends with my parents and they were able to reach out and see if I wanted to um, participate. So I was I said, yes, of course, I want to do that. And, <laughs> and then I got to speak to the people who were designing the room and wanted to uh, have a certain aspect made and some very particular feeling and everything. So I ended up um, working with them and created a piece using uh, flagging tape from the like Lowe's or Home Depot. <laughs> you know, it was like very... Um, fluorescent, it was knitted, arm knitted, and it was a big uh, hanging structure that I got to have like in their, in their fun setting that they made for all the cool people of the furniture market world. <laughs> but well, it is part of the say, part of the school that you're the training that you're getting right now. Do they do they talk some about how to get seen and how to get your work out there? When I was in art school, that was least of their concerns, but I think now there's more of that, right? Oh, yes. And I can't speak for every school, but uh, Georgia State has a class called Professional Practices. And so um, it's very common if they have that class that they're teaching you not only how to do your website and how to present yourself as an artist in professional settings and how to speak about your art, mm -hmm. but also how to approach galleries, how to um, prepare packets for that kind of uh, approach where you might, you know, give your portfolio to somebody. Um, but there's like a certain way to do that um, successfully or else it comes off as like really pushy sometimes. So it's, it's good to to learn about those things. And there are a lot of good books out there. Um, and I'm trying to think of the book that I had, but it was yellow and it was, I think called artwork. And there's like two slashes in between art and work. Artwork is the book title. Um, I don't remember the author, I'm sorry. Um, but that has been a really big help um, for anybody who's looking to be a professional artist, visual artist, like that is a go-to on how to put everything together very professionally. Well, you, you use a variety of materials mm -hmm. and you know we've seen several of those and we've, you also used a variety of techniques. And these next two works um, that we're gonna look at, I was curious, when you're deciding on a piece, do you decide on the concept first and then the material or do it the other way around or does it vary? Most of the time I'm working with the material first and I wanna okay. see like what I can do with it. Um, but then once I 
get you know into something that I'm enjoying, um, especially like through the VHS tape, uh, I've done a lot with that. And sometimes the concepts that I've tacked on to previous work uh, drive the direction that I'm going in for future works. So there's a little bit of both, um, but all in all, like especially in new pieces uh, with new materials, it's the material that comes first to me and the techniques and what I like to do with that material. So I'm really focused more on uh, the hands-on, like, am I enjoying what I'm doing first off? You know, I, I, if you know, sometimes the concept is like, well, I definitely need to do this to this material because the concept makes more sense that way. Um, and so I work a little bit of, it just depends on the piece, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but um, all in all, like I, I really love working with the material and the techniques. And so that usually comes first. You're like an explorer, you know? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I feel like it. <laughs> what are you gonna do with this? And what can you make out of that? And that's that's neat. Um, can you, uh, oh, sorry, Mandy, would you put that piece back up? I want you to talk a little bit more about the one on the left because that's woven, correct? Yes, yeah, so. Some of our um, weavers are gonna wanna know about it. So let's just talk course. about it. <laughs> of course. So the one on the left, um, <laughs> is called a prototype for recalling visual noise. And it's uh, my idea, it's also with VHS tape. It's all, um, my idea with this was that I would create a piece that as I'm weaving, you know, the VHS into place, I'm creating some sort of imagery, right? So that's me conjuring up memories that have been lost um, and I decided to frame it in this half woven, unwoven uh, sculptural piece. The wood piece off the wall is representative of the front beam of my loom. And then I had to find a reed that I, is at the very bottom of the uh, hand dyed yarn there. So the reed is separating out the strands still. And I've even chained up the rest of the warp so that it's um, kind of still in this fresh, you know, ready to be on, put on the loom kind of uh, aspect at the bottom of the weaving. And then the patterning that I came up with was um, like, a, it's conjuring up a imagery of static from television screens. Um, so it's kind of this still noisy, image that's happening as it's being woven. I love that. So the tape is the weft? Yes. Okay. Well, that surprised me. I thought you were going to say it. that's wool. I, I'm, I was surprised. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's very cool. And also, I'm glad I asked because I didn't realize that's the reed at the bottom. Yeah. That's cool. Thank you. Another one. I wish I could see it. That's another piece. That it, <laughs> and I do love the hanger that you know it does represent the back in the beam that's a great idea i was thinking all exhibits should show fiber that way <laughs> it looks good. so the other feather in your cap that and and living here in atlanta i think it's amazing that um this happened is that you were invited to teach basketry workshops for the high museum of art uh, and it coincided with stephen burke's exhibit um, shelter in place. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I think that's such a big deal is I have, have experience with the high and they are not real open or they have not been real open to anything fiber as far as exhibits or being involved with that. So I think it's wonderful that they invited you in to do that, you know, to have that experience to go along with the exhibit. What was that like for you? Oh, it was amazing. I got an invitation in the email, like out of the blue from uh, someone from their lifelong learning program. And they told me about it. And I uh, was like, yes, I do want to participate. And so they gave me a, a look at the pieces before the show was even up. Uh, and so I'm just online, not in person or anything. Yeah, but but still. <laughs> And so I, <laughs> I got to see the pieces that were 
being exhibited and really gravitated to those um, large pieces that he's made that have traditional basketry in them, but in a very contemporary way. So I said, hey, what if we did this sort of thing where we could you know, learn traditional basketry at the same time as making something functional that they can take home with them and continue to use. And so I ended up um, like dyeing a bunch of three different colors and making these little kits to make either like fruit baskets or these um, cool pendant lamp shades out of the, um, the, uh, the, the read. And so we got to um, go through the exhibit with the students and uh, look at the artwork. And I got to talk about the artwork, which was kind of fun. I'm not usually in that sort of sense, you know, a docent or something like that. So <laughs> I got to play that part for a little bit. And then we went back downstairs and had a fun time weaving. And it was really just a wonderful environment like everybody was there because they really wanted to learn the techniques and see the show of course but also to do this project and um so it was an amazing experience being able to teach that many people who were so eager to learn i love it that they're doing more of the hands-on stuff that's great mm -hmm. that's great yeah. good for you i'm glad they they brought you in for that that's amazing well, you're, you're so busy. There's so much going on. I can't wait for this question. So what's next for you? <laughs> well, in the spring is going to be my uh, thesis show, which is pretty much most of my headspace is at like right now, uh, preparing for that. But I also have two group exhibits that I'm a part of. Uh, one that is in um, Marietta, Georgia, which is going to be at the Marietta Cobb Museum of Art. Uh, they're putting on a textiles exhibit in April, so check that out. And then in Asheville, North Carolina, I am going to be a part of an alumni show at my undergrad, UNC Asheville. And so um, I'm going to be putting some pieces up there at the end of February. Mm. Um, and after that, I will be graduating. <laughs> So um, after I graduate, I do plan on continuing to teach. Right now I teach at GSU as an instructor, a graduate instructor. And so I, I hope that I will be teaching somewhere, teaching fibers um, as a professor. Oh, good. Yeah. <clears throat> Any place in particular you want to go or anything in particular you want to teach? <clears throat> Oh, I mean, I, as just starting out, you know, I, I just want to be somewhere that's going to have a lot of eager students that want to learn about any kind of technique and textiles. I think it's great to um, get people excited about textiles because there are so many different ways to go about that sewing felting weaving yeah, yeah. you know so i can i i teach a lot of different mm -hmm. uh, methods and and i'm just excited to to give that a, um you know forward to young artists well there you go we're sending it out to the universe <laughs> please do <laughs> we're looking for a, a home a good place for sally to teach y'all would be lucky to have her Thank well, um, let's ask some questions. We got a lot of questions. Let's see if we can get to these. Um, oh, back to the dress. How did you do the bodice? Was that, I mm. should ask that way back then. Did oh, you, sure. yeah. was that woven or was it crocheted or what? So the bottom part was um, crocheted. And uh -huh. I knew I wanted to do that because that is the technique I was working with at the time. And the bodice was where I, had no necessarily like skills with how to create a form fitted you know figure with a plastic tape mm -hmm. so I I ended up uh weaving it against a um dress form <laughs> with like pins in place and so I put my warp with pins up and then I wove <laughs> it through and then had the uh, bodice in the back um, be something that could be cinched so it could be altered to size um, for the model. Well, that was clever. 
That's mm -hmm. good. You're such the problem solver. <laughs> well, you kind of have to be with plastic um, yeah. because the tape, if you tear that tape, it's, you know, it separates really easily. And it was an interesting material to work with, but it comes with problem solving. <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, this is a good question. This is from Sue Sear. Hi, Sue. Sue always comes up with my good questions. Um, how does one store the VHS tape? So are the work, the finished piece, so that like the linear pieces can be deinstalled or is it just a one-time use material? Well, I don't want it to be a one-time use material because I've already reused it and I really hate the idea of those things going back into a landfill. Right. Um, so I've been holding on to it, you know, for as long as possible, but um, of course it has its lifespan. Um, and so I have really treated it like a, textile a fiber and rolled it up so it, it kind of condenses pretty easily uh -huh. um and i uh, have it in like a storage container like the biggest one i could find uh -huh. <laughs> um <laughs> so that's not necessarily the most archival to have it in that but it is uh, protected from the elements and it's it's um you know ready to unroll and reinstall if necessary so <laughs> uh olivia hicks wants to know how do you color the vhs tape she said she's woven with cassette tape but would like to have uh, more than brown because of the hanging piece like the bottom of it was um, much lighter was that a different kind of tape or did you change the color of it that was actually two different materials so the warp was actually a hand dyed uh, cotton yarn. Uh -huh. And then the weft was the VHS. And because it's plastic, uh, I don't know that you can really uh, dye it. I haven't tried. Um, I would assume that you could dye cassette tape the brown. Mm -hmm. If anything, maybe give that a go because they have a coating on them, right? That that's where the music is held. Right. I, I don't know anything about that, but um, there's plastic, which is not going to maybe it will die a little bit, but the um, coating on the back may or may not take on a different color. Um, the VHS, it depends on, um, I guess, when the VHS was made. Sometimes it's two shiny surfaces, so you really probably couldn't color that um, other than like spraying it with spray paint. But well, the I, bottom of the piece was lighter than the top. Was that from the warp or? It was the exposed warp, yes. So the okay. the weaving only went down three quarters of the way. Oh, okay, okay. I guess I didn't look at that very closely. Um, well, a couple of people have asked to see the installation at High Point, and I think Mandy, bless your heart, she went and got it for me. Um, I think we have an image of that. There we go. Oh, there it is. Wow. Um, so. Yeah. Um, this was in High Point, North Carolina, if you want to talk some more about that. Sure, yeah, so this was a really big space in there, and there's like two parts you can see the um, on the left image, like farther in the distance, the other piece, and they really wanted something to go over the seating in the back. Mm -hmm. um, so they gave me the dimensions and um, the prompt, you know, and so um, they had like a neon uh, I can't remember the vibe, but they, on the back wall, they had um, like a graffiti style thing saying high point, you know, market. And so uh, this is arm knit. Um, I cut the, the flagging tape into certain um, lengths so that it would like model the different colors together and then uh, left the tails hanging down so that it would give it more uh, dimension and in uh, interest. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else to go along with this, but it was also an interesting thing to install. I had help from several people, including my parents. <laughs> who were able to, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, Somebody just wants to see the cat. It just popped up. Would you show us the cat? <laughs> if she'll let me, if she'll let me grab her. 
Yeah, that's why cats are. They will show <laughs> themselves when they want to be shown. There we are. This is Millie, my sister's cat. <laughs> now you're a star <laughs> in, the, in the fiber world. You're a star. <laughs> um, yeah, a couple of people want to know about your upcoming shows. So where and when is the, um, your senior show? And the, if you could talk about the Marietta show again. Sure. People okay. happen to be in the area. Yeah. Um, my show is going to be at, so my thesis show is going to be at the Arts Exchange. And that's Arts X Change, Exchange, <laughs> um, in Atlanta. On, so it opens, let's see if I, I do know this, <laughs> but April 4th. So whatever that Tuesday is, they're closed on Mondays. Um, so April 4th through the 14th, the opening reception is going to be on the 7th, that Friday, um, uh, in the evening. I don't know the time yet. Um, and then the Marietta show at the museum there is going to be opening at about the same time in April on the 1st. That's when the reception is. Um, but I don't know for sure what the time is yet. They will put out um, a lot of, a lot more information closer to them. And that's going to be, the show is going to be up until June, the beginning of June. And if you happen to be in Asheville, <laughs> the, the show at- Oh, I UNC, forgot that one, sorry. Yeah, the show at UNC Asheville is a group of an alumni shows. And, uh, uh, works and then that begins on the 23rd of February and goes until March 10th and they have a wonderful new gallery in their art building which is called Owen Hall so um, I am really excited to show work in their beautiful new gallery. <laughs> well great I like it that the university supports their graduates that way That's yeah a idea. yeah all alumni stuff there well, so how you said you went to Ireland, how, how do you mm -hmm. think, um, one thing I thought about when I was in college, I felt like I was in a cocoon, you know, you're working so hard trying to get stuff done, you've got your classes and everything. So what was it like to travel and kind of break away from academia for a little while? Uh, it was incredible. Uh, we went as a group of the graduate students, the rising third year graduates. Um, and we were able to do a little bit of traveling, a little bit of sightseeing, a little bit of um, events that they put together for all the schools. Um, and uh, so it was really inspiring to be able to go out and be a part of something um, that still centered around our art making, but wasn't as rigid um, as school, which really is kind of like you know, production, 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 and then critique and thinking a lot, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was nice to approach art in a way that was less pressure on creating something that was going to come back with us because for the most part, the works that we created, uh, unless you could put it in a suitcase or ship it to yourself, which I did a little bit of, but not any shipping to myself, but um, I didn't keep uh, about 90% of what I made, you know? So I, mm -hmm. that left the pressure of like creating something amazing, which still happens, you know, because you get into a, a spot like that where you're um, not as worried about the outcome. And then you can kind of uh, go through this creative process where it doesn't matter. Okay, here's what I can do. And then all of a sudden you see new things that you didn't know you could do. Um, which actually was, uh, for me, earth art, like working outside with the seaweed. And, um, so I did do some weavings out on the beach with seaweed. And so that actually turned into something in my, um, thesis work that, uh, I would not have had if I hadn't have gone there, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but I highly recommend working doing some work at residencies if possible, um, because there is really this idea that you can go and work on a project or 
you know, come with without a plan if you feel like you need the time and the resources to um, explore. The other thing I'm always curious about is how do you have the time and energy to teach and work on your own degree? Because that's what yeah. you're doing right now, right? It is what I'm doing right now. And it's uh, difficult, but it's not impossible. Uh, um, and it's just a lot of organization of your time and learning how to um, learning how to teach has been really rewarding, but um, I've never really felt like it was too much of an imposition on my time for my studio work. Um, you just have to work a lot more, you know, for like my time is just mostly geared towards <laughs> school <laughs> in one way or another. It's either my work or preparing for teaching um, and getting lesson plans together and um, then going and doing it. And um, I don't know that you just get into a rhythm and a balance and it becomes second nature. That's hard work. That's, that's <laughs> it is still, yeah. It's it's for someone work. is younger. <laughs> <laughs> so I always talk to people and they, um, when they're talking about school and they say, well, you know, if I handed to do all over again, um, and even though you're, you, you don't have a lot of distance between school and, and uh, what you're doing now, what would you do differently if you were right at the beginning of going back to school or going to school? What would you do differently, do you think? I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. There's always something where I'm like, if I had just done this slightly different, then I could have like change the small thing, you know, but I don't know in the grand scheme of things, if I would have changed anything. I um, took some time in between uh, my undergraduate degree and my master's degree. And that was actually very helpful for me. And that would be the first thing I would say is like, oh, I wouldn't have waited so long, but then, you know, I wouldn't have had the maturity to, uh, you know, go through grad school with this kind of level of commitment and everything. So it just, um, there's two sides to every coin, I guess. So right, right. I'm not sure if I know offhand a good answer for that. Like I, I'm pretty set with like how things are shaping up so far. <laughs> I'm thankful. Who were some of the people that inspired you while you were either before you got into school or while you were in school? Because you talked about seeing one of those works that, oh, you that you'd seen them do that technique before. Mm -hmm. Well, who else was somebody that you think inspired you along the way? Well, a lot of so I have a lot of art artists that I look at, and um, during that time, <laughs> it just uh, it depends on which body of work we're talking about, you know. Uh -huh. um, but there were a lot of. Uh, installation artists that I was looking at and still look at. And so some of those um, artists would be Gabriel Daw, who is, a, um, you've probably maybe seen his work. He does these big string installations that have thread mm -hmm. um, that are like rainbows or spectrum, color spectrums. Um, and so that was a big inspiration when I was working on the undergrad work and um, let's see. Um, Sue Sunny Park was another artist that I still love the insula her installations. She's an instructor up north, but not in textiles. She does sculpture um, work. And so she has these big installations that were really influential on my past work that were big chain link fences like molded into these beautiful shapes and then inside each opening of the fence was a where I guess she hand tied each piece but um mm -hmm. these iridescent glass pieces or plexiglass wow. that the gallery light I mean it was just it's incredible you have to see it um but it's incredible they it's like pinkish, bluish, the shadows are colorful and it's just like this underwater magical 
installation. And so, I mean, that's kind of where my head has always been at is like trying to create environments and, and different, showing different um, ideas through materials. Um, and I really have a lot of respect for installation artists who can create <laughs> huge pieces of work and, and environments that can really envelop the viewer in. So what is it like to be the inspiration for others now? Oh. As a teacher, you are, you know, the other, your students are oh. looking at you now. What's that yeah, like? it's, so, it's so nice. Um, it's nice to have students who are interested in my work, too. Um, it kind of surprises me when they do ask about it. You know, as a, a teacher, you know, you can, of course, show your work, but sometimes it, it can influence your students. And so you don't want to just overly, you know, say, you know, this is my work, this is, you know, subconsciously what I'm asking you to make, you know, like, I don't want to put that pressure on my students. So I don't often go into the very beginning, you know, tell it, showing them my work, but I will tell them about my work and inspire them that way. And then um, this past semester, you know, towards the end, I just got like, well, when are, can we go to your studio and, and see your work? And so I led like, <laughs> A group of my students into my my studio and got to share my work with them and it was really it was it was really inspiring like knowing that they were interested right in my work um oh, that's great that's great I would have I would have loved that as a, a student uh, that was never an option I would have loved that that would have been great yeah it's nice to have a studio on campus to be able to do that yeah that's true, that's true. Well, thank you so much for being here today. We do appreciate it. It's, well, thank it's you. nice to see somebody who's doing fiber and, and that you're continuing. And um, we appreciate you taking your time today and being on the show. I really appreciate you having me. Um, just a reminder, we want to thank our sponsor. Mm -hmm. And again, that is Grace Tully. Grace, thank you so much for being our sponsor today. Um, again, it, it, it's great that we have people who are able and willing to make programs like this happen and that can help Sally with her future um, endeavors because there's going to be a great job that comes out of this. I know it is. And uh -huh. Sally's going to let me know and I'll keep you all updated on her perfect job. So thank you so much, Grace, for being a sponsor in today. Um, if you want to learn more about Sally, you can go to her website, which is sallygarner.com. And uh, you can see more of her work and more information about her. If you would like to sponsor an episode of Textiles and Tea or your business or your guild, and a lot of guilds have been um, doing that, uh, just contact us. You can go online to wespendie.org and you can get information about uh, being a sponsor. I do wanna uh, thank everybody who sponsors us and also donates. It's really important that people understand that things like the Certificate of Excellence, um, the magazine Shuttle Spindle and Dye Pot, Careers in Textiles, the Guild Retreat, those things are all funded through the donations to the Fiber Trust. And that's what makes this programming happen. So we do appreciate all the, um, the funding that comes from those donations. And because we're coming up on the end of the year, you got a couple more weeks before, um, and you can still donate and get um, that tax write off because we are a 501c. So think about what you would like to donate, what you can donate to keep this program going. We're excited to what's gonna happen next in 2023. It'll be wonderful. Um, so you can go online to weavespendie.org or you can call us if you want to call us and donate that away. If you've missed any of the episodes, as always, you can watch them on Facebook, on the HGA Facebook page. You can um, watch them on YouTube. We're gradually getting those up, and you can watch them there. Um, you can watch them again or share them with your friends. We appreciate that. Um, next week, we have Christine Keller, all the way from New Zealand, who's going to be on um, um, Textiles and Tea, and we're pretty excited about that. I want to wish everybody happy holidays, whether it's Merry Qu Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa. 
Uh, I hope you have a wonderful holiday weekend. Stay safe. I know part of the United States is going to get some cold, cold weather and ice and snow. I, even down here in Georgia, we're going to get some of that. Have a wonderful and safe holiday week, and we will see you next week. Happy tea and happy holidays.